You know, we've we've uh, started out back at the uh, at the end of December as we finished uh, last year. We started looking at uh, at preparing for 40 days of consecration. And this is going to kind of line up somewhat with Lent. I mean, we we each year we kind of start the year in a in a set apart way, and so. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started looking at consecration and what does that look like and what does that feel like. And it really comes to be a, be a setting apart that we're setting, first of all, we're going to set some time apart to be special to God. But, but more important than that, we're recognizing that, that each of us needs to be set apart for God. And then a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about consecrated relationships. And we talked about family we talked about our, our spouses and how we needed to have that, that sense of consecration, that that's, that's set apart and that's special, and those are, those are special relationships. We talked, Pastor Wayne talked about our, our relationship with Christ and how that's, that's setting apart. Um, but sometimes, as we look at these things that we're setting apart, um, Sometimes there's things that are a little awkward to talk about. There's, uh, have, you, have you ever heard the term an elephant in the room? Now that would be awkward, wouldn't it? But, but you know, there's, there's a, sometimes there's an elephant in the room. I was just realizing, just thinking this morning, that in different rooms there's different elephants. And uh, we'll just take a look at, at what the dictionary, let's define this elephant in the room. In, in the Cambridge Dictionary it says, if you say there's an elephant in the room, you mean that there's an obvious problem or, or a difficult situation that people don't want to talk about, but it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, we've got a couple other def definitions here. There's, there's another elephant. The phrase dictionary calls it an important and obvious topic, which everyone is aware of, but uh, discussion is considered kind of uncomfortable. Ooh. And then... Uh, my dear friend, Wikipedia, they say the term refers to a question, problem, solution, or controversial issue, which is obvious to everyone who knows about the situation, but which is deliberately ignored because to do otherwise would cause great embarrassment or trigger arguments or is simply taboo. And you know, I, I realize that in, in different places, there are different elephants in the room. Uh, in some households, we don't talk about sex. And in some, we, we, we don't, people are quite open about those things. And in some households, in some churches, there are some things that are just obvious, and, and we, we talk about them all the time. And in some churches, like, like Lawson, there, there's, there's different things that we don't talk about. One of the things that we, we don't really talk about a lot at, at Lawson is, uh, is money. And so, uh, what you got in your wallet? So sometimes the best way to, uh, to deal with the elephant room is just to take the covers off and expose it. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, about money this morning. You know, Pastor John, uh, before he left back in, in December... He sent an email out on December 26th. And I've been fretting about this ever since. Well, I've been fretting about it. I've been praying about it. And, you know, I was in a church before, one of the, the previous churches we were in. Money was not a something that you didn't talk about. It was pretty, pretty open to talk about. And I remember taking up an offering one time, and I used an illustration. I came in with a, a scoop shovel, great big shovel. And we talked about how... Scripture talks about with the measure that you measure, it'll be measured unto you. And, uh, you know, that went, that went fine. But Lawson's a little different. Lawson's a little uncomfortable about that. You know, this, this thing about the elephant in your room, it's, it's things we don't want to talk about. Like, psst, I think your fly's open. Yeah, or who's going to tell Steve that he really needs to have a shower? You know, that's just, it's just awkward. You just, don't want to, you just don't want to deal with it. Anyway, um, so we're going to talk, first of all, we're going to talk about, 
about tithing because that makes people feel really, really creepy. And so we'll, we're just going to, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, right? So who's coming with me? Okay, we're going to take a look at, before, we're going to take a look at tithing and see what the law says about it. And, and you know, tithing came along even before the law. We think about, oh, that's legalism. But the tithe was established well before the law. We see Abraham going out and he's battling and he's, he's rescuing Lot, actually. And, and he comes back and he meets this character called Melchizedek. And, and so what does he do? Melchizedek, king of Salem, he comes back, blesses Abraham for his, his, his aggression to go and, and recover these people. And Abraham re recognized him. He said, blessed be God, most who ho ho Maybe I'll try that again in English. Blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth or a tithe of all. So that's years, decades, generations before the law was even given. We see another, two generations later, we see Jacob. And, and what does Jacob do? He's, he's running off he, he, and he, gets, has an account, he has a God encounter. He, God meets him. And what does he say? Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey, give me food to eat and garments to wear, that I will set up this pillar, this will be God's house, and of all you give me, surely I will give a tenth to you. And again, this is still generations before, before the law is given. So let's take a look at, at what happens in the law. You know, because we, we hear that's, that's the legal part of, of tithing. And uh, let's, let's take a look at what the, the law says. At the giving of the law, so Moses comes down from the mountain, he's got the law, and he says, there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your tithes, your contributions of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings. You know what's interesting in here? Tithes is just kind of tucked in the middle of there. There's a whole bunch of offerings in addition to tithes, and we get all worried and upset just about when we're talking about tithes. And that's, that's just a part of it, folks. And God will rejoice in all your undertakings in which the Lord God has blessed you. So his giving of, of tithes is a, is a required part of the law. And, you know, sometimes we kind of get serious with God, and then sometimes we get a little less serious with God. And, and uh, that's what happened to the Israelites. And, and we see that they kind of wandered away, and then they got refreshed. And, and so we look at Malachi, and here he is coming back, and, and, and here Malachi says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but how? How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you're cursed with a curse. For you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this. You know, it's interesting. I, I think this is the only, it's the only part I've found. I think it's the only part of Scripture that says, test me. You know, we see Jesus, at, and, and he's being, when he's being tempted, and Satan challenges him, and he says, no, 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 you don't, don't test God. Here, God is welcoming us to test him. Prove this. See if this is not so. Test me says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing till it overflows and I'll rebuke the devourer, I'll rebuke the one that takes from you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your ground nor the vine of your field nor cast your grapes. So your crops will come in, your job will be satis satisfying and rewarding. Boy, you folks are sure quiet. Well, this is the, uh, the head part of the matter. This is what Scripture says, and we can either accept it or we can reject it. We can agree or disagree that Jesus is never, no, 
Jesus is concerned about the, the knowledge, about the, the head part. But he's, he's far more concerned about our heart. And so this is, this is Old Testament. This is under the law. We're under grace, right? Are we under grace? Yeah, so, so we, can, we, we don't need to worry about that stuff, right? Right. Come on. It's okay, folks. It's okay. I, I noticed a, a pastor that, that I found this quote, and it says, what really makes us uncomfortable is that money and all related issues strike right at our hearts. Money is a heart issue. How do I know? Jesus talked more about matters relating to money. 25% of the time, he talked about money. He knew his words would be the word of God, and so through Jesus' words, we get a glimpse of what God thinks when it comes to finances. Jesus seems to talk about money in relation to it being a good reflection of where our heart is. In other words, it's a, an indicator, a test of our, our heart condition. So um, let's, let's go into the New Testament and see what, what Jesus' thought is on this. So in 12.33, it says, Sell your possessions, give to charity. We're, give yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It's, it's interesting. He, you know, it, it's interesting to me. He doesn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be. He, he says where you, where you put your treasure, that's, that's where your heart will be. Um. Uh, You know, I, I, one time, a, a long time ago, uh, in a dark, and long, long ago and far, far away. How's that for, for being vague? Uh, I had a, a pastor that, that I had some, some issues with. There were some things I just, but in order to keep, check my heart, I would, every week I'd walk up to him and give him a Christian handshake and uh, that's where you have a, a bill folded in your hand as you're, as you're shaking somebody's hand. Because I wanted to be sure that my heart was right before him. And it was just my weird way of checking my heart condition. Please do not do that to me. <laughs> okay? <laughs> uh, there was... We... we we take a look at our hearts. Jesus talked about the, the rich young ruler. And he said, what, what do I have to do? I've done this and this and this and this. He said, well, one thing you have to do, sell your possessions and give to the poor. And he was sad because that's where his, that's where his heart was. So how then do we give? You know, we, we, what do we do? It's scripture seems to be pretty clear that we should be we should be giving out of ourselves. So how do we do that? What do we what do we do? And I found a couple of ways that we should we should give. We should give with the right attitude, the right motivation. Um, let let's look at Luke eleven, and then I, I've I've got a different story. Okay, woe to you Pharisees, for you pay the tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb. Yet you disregard justice and the love of God. But these things you should be doing. Just, you should be treating people justly and loving God without disregarding the former. You should tithe. But in addition to that, you should be taking care of people. You should be treating people right. You should be, you should be having the right heart attitude. You know, I was, I was thinking of... of um, Jesus said the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and you know, um, 
we, we know what, what this is, right? And, you know, it, it, it looks like a bill, and, and it is. But, but really what it is, you know, that's, that's a little piece of my life. I, I sacrificed a, a part of my life to get this. And so when I put that into the offering plate, that's taking a part of me. You know, Romans 12, 1 or 2 says we, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Part of our life goes into that offering plate when we give an offering. And, and that's, that's the attitude we have to take in, that, that we're giving of ourselves completely and wholly. So we need to give with the right motivation. We need to give regularly. Uh, 1 Corinthians talks about on the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save and set aside to, to give to others on a regular basis, not eh, once a year if I get around to it. We, uh, it, it, it's right there. It just says, do it. Now, I, I don't know why. I think God's wanting to find our hearts. He says to give cheerfully. In Corinth, 2 Corinthians, we got that? There we go. So it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. Man, your giving has inspired other people. But I've sent the brethren in order that our boasting may, n may not be empty. I don't want to embarrass me. I don't want to embarrass you. So that if I was, what I was saying, you may be prepared. Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, would be put to shame by this confidence. I've been bragging about you, but I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to be mistaken. Okay? So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift not affected by covetousness. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. sparingly. He, who spo re he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we should give with cheerfulness. You know, it was talking about, about sowing and, and, and uh, sowing. I, I talked to his guy, and it was, it was, this is a funny, I thought it was funny. Anyway, this guy, this is a number of years ago, true story. He talked about, he was, he was seeding one spring, and he'd misset the drill. And, and so he, yeah, yeah, oh. And he put in way too much way more than he normally would went into the ground. And, and he, he, he caught it part way through. And, and so he, he fixed his situation. And, but uh, come harvest time, you know, all that that he, he messed up on, it was great. It actually grew, and, and it was, he, he, had a, he had a bumper crop. He was really impressed. Yeah. So you know what he did next spring? Take a guess. What did he do next spring? Heavy up? Well, sadly, no. He went back to the old way. But you, you know, we, we sometimes we get illustrations, we get things like that that are right in our face, and, and, we, and we can can learn from them, and we say, no, man, I've never done it that way before. I don't want to do that. And we go back and we get the same results that we always have. You know, Giving, sometimes you, you get yourselves in, in some, some interesting places. I remember one time we were at a meeting. I was up, I was on the, on the platform. I was speaking at this meeting, and uh, there was going to be an offering. And I signaled to Stella. And, and, and so, you know, there's, there's a, there was a great chasm fixed between us. We couldn't cross at that point in time. And, and so we're, we're trying to, with hand signals and, and trying to, to give some indication how much we should give. And, and we got that. Kind of figured out, and you know, okay, okay, and 
okay, yeah, we got it, okay. And uh, so I wrote out a check for, for the amount, just like we uh, discussed long distance, and, and, uh, and Stella wrote out a check for the amount like we discussed long distance. <laughs> And uh, and so we got a we got a double offering or placed a double offering there, and uh, it was just it was just it was just. I guess that's what we, I I think we cut in half what God wanted us to give that day. So uh, there's there's sometimes some illustrations of giving. We found one. This is somebody that uh, I kind of kind of admire. This is kind of a an interesting video. It's just. Bear with us for a couple minutes as we watch this video of Rick Warren and his, his perspective on giving. Then the, the third trap of leadership, um, the antidote to materialism, which is the temptation to have, I see it and I want it, is, is generosity. And generosity is... You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. If you want to become like Christ, which is, by the way, the goal of life, Romans 8, 29, you must learn to be generous. And you must learn to be more and more generous every year. And that's been a, a long journey in my life. Which just, just say what you've done in terms of your own life, in terms of generosity. When Kay and I got married 37 years ago, we made a commitment that we would, get, would be more generous every single year. So when we got married 37 years ago, we first started with the basic tithe, 10%. Tithe means 10%. The Bible says in Malachi 3, you're not tithing, you're robbing God. It's God's money. So we made a commitment when we got married, God gets paid first in our life. Not leftovers, God gets paid first. We may be in debt to everybody else, but we are not going to be in debt to God. The first 10% goes to God. At the end of our first year of marriage, we raised our tithe to 11%. At the end of our second year of marriage, we raised it to 12%. At the end of our third year of marriage, we raised it to 13%. On years that we would um, get a raise or things would go good, we'd raise it 3 or 4%. On years that we were flat broke and the cupboard was bare and we were barely making it, we'd raise it a quarter of a percent because every year we were going to be more generous. Now. We weren't doing this to show off, Nikki. I didn't tell anybody about it for nearly 30 years. Um, but we, each year we kept raising it and raising it and raising it. Um, this last year we raised it another percent. Uh, Kay and I give away 91% and live on nine. Now, I, I have lived in a, I've been playing this game with God for 37 years where God says, Okay, Rick, we're going to play this game. You give to me, and I'll give to you, and we'll see who wins. <laughs> I have lost that game for 37 years. You cannot outgive God. I dare you. I dare you. People, th th let me just challenge you. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. And if you're not becoming more generous every year, you need to work on that. Okay, you just need to work on that and watch God's blessing on your life. People ask me, why do you think God chose you to write the book? I said, because God knew what I'd do with the money. They said, well, yeah, God gave me tens of million dollars. I'd give away too. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. If you're not doing it now, you won't later. I had a 25-year track record of being generous in poverty. And... That's all I'll say about that. Is, is that incredible? You, you know what I find re really incredible about that? Anybody so organized, they would know they could give a quarter of a percent more next year. I, and that just, that baffles me. That's, that's way beyond me. Giving away ninety-one percent—that's beyond me too, but uh, it's, it's more understandable than, than 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 that level of planning. He he talked really about living in contentment, and you know, folks, that's that's really what it's about. It's not 
about the dollars that are coming in the door. It's not the dollars that are leaving. It's, it's are we content with where we're at? And, and that's a huge thing. He talked a little bit about consumerism, that we want to have everything, and we want it right now, and we want to have bigger, shinier, faster, so much. We put these, these huge expectations on ourselves. So how else do we want to give? We want to give with kingdom perspective. Rick Warren's got a kingdom perspective in his giving. Are we giving into kingdom stuff? Check your checkbook. Well, nobody uses a checkbook anymore, but if you if you look through your spending, how much of it is going to kingdom stuff and how much of it is going to to me? And folks, again, Scripture gives us a, an indication to, oh, pardon me. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but give to the, store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't break in and steal. Folks, we can't take it with us. I was at, I was at two funerals yesterday, and you know they didn't take a dime with them. But we can send it ahead. And we should also give missionally. Paul talks to us about giving to, to missions, giving to those that are reaching out. Go ahead to that one, Dave, Second Corinthians. And here he's, he's talking about giving to the churches in Macedonia, giving to the churches in Altai, Russia, Giving to missions. We, folks, one of the things I really like about this, about Lawson Church, is we do things outside of our four walls. Whether it's so outside of our four walls someplace in the city or outside our four walls someplace in the wide world, we, we are looking at things outside of ourselves. And I just want to encourage you to do the same, to look at things outside of yourselves, not just what's in it for me. Paul talks about um, in Philippians. We got that, Dave? There we go. How he's been content. He's, he's, he knows how to get along in humility and humble means. He knows how to live in prosperity, being filled or going hungry, having abundance or suffering need. But I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction so that you yourselves know that the first preaching of the gospel after I left, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I'm seeking the gift. Isn't that interesting? Not that I seek the gift itself. Not that I'm wanting to have money from you. But the profit that increases to your account. Folks, when we live generously... We get blessed. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I can't work it out in math. But the more we give, we are blessed. And he goes on to say, and my God, you now I've received the gift, and my God will supply all of your needs. Because you've supplied my needs, God will supply your needs according to his riches and glory. I, that's right. I don't, I don't understand it. I just know it happened. And uh, most of all, we should give from, from a desire to please God and to honor his word. Can anybody agree to that? Yeah, all this, this stuff, if I'm saying that just, and I, I not want to make anybody feel guilty or bad or obligated, what's really important is, am I honoring God's word? Am I honoring him? And uh, so I just want to talk for, for just a couple minutes about that. There's, uh, in, in Acts 17, Paul's talking about going to the, uh, the Bereans. 
And they sent Paul and Silas, Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, now these were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. And so what did they do? These noble-minded Christians, what did they do? They examined the scriptures to see if these things were so. And so, folks, that's what I'm going to invite you to do. Examine the scriptures. You know, I, I remember we were running a small group, this is a number, a lot of years ago, and we would do uh, an offering. And uh, I had one of my, my, my assistant, my helper, I said to him, I tell you what, next week, how about you take up the offering, okay? And he said, oh, gee, I, I, don't, I don't know. I said, yeah, well, fine, just, you know, find some scripture about giving, about, about money, about finances, and, and you know, try it. Well, okay, and I said, but there's not very many scriptures about finances. I don't know. So I said, well, find one. And so the next week he found one, and and at the same time I went out and I bought him a concordance. You know, one of the big, thick, strong concordance. I mean, I think the reason they call it strong is because it's lifting it is like a workout, right? So I got him one of those, and and uh, so I said the next week I said. You want to do the offering again next week? He said, well, okay. And he's, now he's got this, this workout manual with him. And uh, he came back next week. He said, man, there's a lot in there about giving. How about that? But, you know, there's so much in there, but we don't, don't dig in and take a, take a look at it. So I'm going to encourage you this week to, to spend time in the Word. Take a look, examine the Scriptures, and see what God has to say about it. Don't believe me. You know, one of the things I, can, it, can we go down a little bunny trail? We'll, we'll go back, way, way back to Genesis. And, and, you know, Adam talks to, God talks to Adam and says, don't eat the tree. Don't eat from that tree. And then uh, later along, Eve comes along, and I think, I think Adam probably had a chat with her saying, don't go there. Don't even touch it. Because, you know, when, when, she's, when she's tempted, she goes way beyond. She says, oh, don't go even near that. You know, God said, you, you can't go near it. You can't touch it. You can't go anywhere. Just stay away. And I think there's some value when God talks to us directly from his word. All of a sudden, it affects us far more than when somebody stands up front and tells us what to do. Okay? So don't believe me, but please check out the scriptures and believe God. Okay? Now, the other way we should be giving, uh, the other thing we need to do, not only examine the scriptures, but we need to act on it. One of my favorite scriptures, uh, putting aside, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, and I've still got some of that wickedness, you know, and I'm putting aside what remains of it. In humility, receive the word implanted. Go to the scripture, receive it in your heart, which is implanted, which is able to save your souls, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely, merely hearers who delude themselves. Yeah. Go through here. Oh, God says I should do that. Yeah. Oh, God's got more instructions for me. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Oh. And I don't do anything about it. It doesn't change. Anything. It's it's like getting a prescription. You go to the doctor and you're not feeling well, and he gives you a, a prescription, and and you take it and you put it in your nightstand. You put it in the medicine cabinet. You don't take it, and you go back to the doctor and says that thing just wasn't working. He said, "Well, did you take the prescription?" Well, well, no, but so so this is the prescription here, folks. This is the medicine. And we take that, we, we ingest it, we look at it, we read it, and then we do what it says. That's not that tricky. You know, I, I, I ran across, I was, I was looking for some material, I found, I found this. This is, this is a book we've been giving away to our first-timers for a while, Faith-Based Family Finances. Ron Blue and Jeremy White, Ron Blue, that's great. You know, I... This, this was published in, uh, the copyright on it was, was 2008. So this is current stuff. This, this is great. You know, we should and I encourage you. We've got a copy of it in the library. I encourage you to get that. 
it's great stuff because we, you know, if you want to supplement what the word says, take a look at what somebody else has to say. Hey, you know what? Let's let's do it. You know, I got this this other one. Money matters for parents and their kids. A scriptural way to learn how to uh, handle money by Ron Blue. Copyright 1988. Whoa. 20 years later, he's still reading the, writing the same stuff, although it's thicker now. And unfortunately, people have been buying that book. They bought the first one. They didn't do it. And now you'll get the second one, and it would be really good if they'd do it. It'd make it that, the change comes in the doing, doesn't it, not just in reading it. And this has been going on for years. I, I found this one in my, my library, yeah. Your Money, Frustration or Freedom, The Biblical Guide to Earning, Saving, Spending, Investing, and Giving. 1971. You know, we've been, we've been talking about this for years. We've been talking about it, talking about it. But folks, what are we doing about it? It's, it's not in the talking, it's in the doing. Um, so... I'm just asking you to, to please to honor God, to honor his word, examine the scriptures, act on the scriptures, and then examine yourself. Haggai talks about a people that have ignored the temple. They've not ignored the house of God. They said, it's, it's not time. We're busy. I got a I, I got a snowmobile to buy and I need to get a new truck and I need a different house and I need a different car and it's it's not time. You know, I haven't got time for, for church. I haven't got time to give to missions. I'm I'm too tied up in my own stuff. And then oh, go back, Dave. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while the house of God lies desolate? This building's in pretty good shape, but if you consider the, the bigger perspective, where we're at as a, as a Christian group, we're pretty desolate. Uh, we've got a lot of, there's a lot of places that can benefit from our finances. Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Take and examine yourselves. Take a look at yourself. You've sown much, but harvest little. You work hard and get nothing. You eat, that there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, and there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one's warm. He must have been referring to today outside there, right? And here, here's the clincher. He, er, he who earns, earns wages to put it in a purse with holes. You ever have a bank account that just seems to kind of have a, just holes in it? Just, it just drains away? I don't know where it goes. It's just, it's just, it just, I put money in there and it's just gone. It just slides away. Thus says the Lord. Again. Take a look at yourself. Consider your ways. And then he gives them instruction to go up and bring wood and bring construction materials that the house of God be rebuilt. Folks, I, I, I don't want this to be anything about making anybody feel uncomfortable. If God's word makes you feel uncomfortable, that's, that's between you and him. But I don't want anybody feeling guilty or feel compelled to give. But I do want you to take a look at the scripture. Now, today, on the connection cards, everybody got their connection card in, in, your, in your bulletin or there should be some extras hanging out there? We're, uh, we've got a couple things in there and... and Please, please fill them out. But one of the things is there, do you want more information? Do you want more scriptures? 
And we're not going to give you a, a, an exhaustive list. In fact, it's not going to be my list. I've asked the, you know, the, the various pastors to give me a, a list of three or four of their favorite scriptures on giving, on their favorite scriptures on finances, because I understand that there's somewhere in the range of 600 scriptures in the Word that talks about finances. I went through this past week, I went through Proverbs, and I found, found 54 in the book of Proverbs that deals with finances. So there's, there's lots in there. But what we're going to do is give you a sampling of, of a dozen or so scriptures. If you, uh, you want to learn more, we're going to give you a sampling of things to, you to look up just, just to get you started, to t get you started to examine the Word, because that's where it's important. That's what's going to touch your heart, and that's what's, what's important to act upon, okay? So if you want that, fill out your connection card. Um, if you... If you uh, want to give to, to this church, this cause, um, we've got the Giving Made Easy forms back at the back at the Connection Center. You can take those. Um, you know, When I came here a little over a little over a year ago, we made uh, we made it. That was a fairly significant financial decision. Uh, it wasn't because of the great huge amounts of money that Pastor John offered me, uh, but there was a it was a there was, it, it created a, a significant financial change for us. But one of the things that I really wanted is that our, it wouldn't change our giving. And I'm thinking that this year, our giving, we've been able to maintain our level of giving in terms of dollars. Uh, we will be at or very close to where we were the year before when, uh, when things were different in our, in our finances. God is faithful in our finances. I've seen him do it over and over. I've seen him do it when when we gave. I, uh, the video talked a little bit about, about when things aren't going well as well. I can remember a time when uh, we went out and found a, I found a fish on my, uh, it was a salmon on my front doorstep, and, and it had a $20 bill tucked inside because we had somebody wanted to bless us. There was a time when uh, Stella was working part-time and she claimed me as a dependent. So there were some times that we've, we've gone through some struggles, folks. But God has blessed us in there, and he's given us that sense of contentment. You know, Paul talked about, I, I figured out how to be content, and that's the big prize. And when we give out of our lack, God will, will honor us. And it's not something that you're going to give a dollar today and get $10 tomorrow. You're not, it's not going to happen. Well, it, it could happen, but it certainly hasn't been my experience. But if we take a look at the long picture, the, the long-term picture, when we are open to giving, when we're open to blessing people, when we're generous, we will receive the generosity of others. I don't understand it, but I enjoy it, and I just want you to walk in that same, that same fullness. 